Hello, and welcome to the 138th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Tuesday, the 17th of November, 2020, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. We invite back Arnold Schroeder, the man behind the Fight Like an Animal podcast, for part three of our dialogue, where we discuss the political implications of his theory we talked about in the previous two episodes. Part four of this series will be released as a Patreon-only episode today or tomorrow, so if this stuff floats your boat, head on over to Patreon and throw me a few coin. This week, I have the patron Amitai Avaram, who upped his pledge and signed up for an annual subscription to thank. This week, we'll also be launching the vote for the next Reading Group series, so patrons, get your votes in, and everybody else, pray to Jeebus that they don't pick that 1000 page evolutionary genetics book Puya has had his eyes on. Okay, let's join the discussion. So Arnold, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is going to be a long one. We've done two parts. This is going to be three and four today. We'll see. Of uh, <laughs> N, where N tends to infinity. Now. Good, solid, solid nerd joke. Yeah. Uh, understood by the nerd that you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if he was a math nerd, but that's good to know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So previously, in the last couple of episodes, we talked about the science that underpins your theory. And before we get into how this theory has implications for political theory, whatever we want to term our our politics, like revolutionary, eco, in that broad general area, what does it mean for our kind of revolutionary politics? So hit us again with a quick reminder on what the theory is. And so we go from there. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that I've probably the the like rhetorical device that I've resorted to one too many times in the podcast at this point is saying over and over again, like, this isn't all academic. This actually like has very material implications for doing politics. But I, I think that the really just like the the most like fundamental characterization that I can make of what I'm doing is talking about the innate contributors to political conflict, to to human behavior in general, and how that manifests in terms of political conflict. And I'm trying to orient people towards a few different aspects of those innate contributors, but like one of the most important ones is just in terms of variation, just that differences in political perspective and behavior actually reflect innate differences between people. And so that implies very different frameworks for, you know, like doing politics, for making a revolution or whatever. And and then some of the other, you know, like things I'm trying to orient people to are just about like how how we talk about about like revolutionary coalitions and stuff like that. But so the the podcast starts, I think maybe still like the most important central insight is this notion that left right politics broadly speaking or like more egalitarian and more hierarchical political orientations to to speak a little more fundamentally have as a partial foundation obviously other factors contribute but as a partial foundation innate psychological variation that i i believe comes out of the biology of aggression and so and so obviously that has some real implications for, you know, like if one political faction tends toward greater aggression than than another, then that's probably going to have some implications in real world power struggles. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time talking about that. I spent a lot of time talking about how the social constructivist framework that kind of has seeped into like that came out of academia, but has translated pretty directly into a lot, a lot of political discourse, even if it's not explicitly referenced, has all these tendencies in it to create divisions between people. So some of the like characteristic problems that we're experiencing in trying to uh, do any kind of organizing to, to make any kind of useful political project, the sort of like internal discord and dissension that we always seem to inevitably get consumed by like actually really has a pretty direct lineage that can be traced to like obscure academic things. And and yeah, and just like orienting people towards 
actual conditions that people experience that change behavior and perception like for instance trauma instead of speaking solely in terms of like social categories you know demographics the the socialization experiences that people have that's that's like a a very very broad overview okay so you you mentioned trauma there what what do you mean by integrating trauma well so i mean i think that that's yeah, that, that's a great place to start because it's it's one of the more vexatious, interesting like aspects of the way that politics is done in um, at least certainly here in the United States that tends to really like like we tend to get to these same points of division over and over and over again. I I think that like the the sort of like really general model of organizing. I mean that's a point that I also like to make is just that. A lot of this bio theory, cognitive science, psychology stuff, it, you know, like it honestly does actually, the implications end up sounding a lot like common sense or stuff that organizers have articulated at points in the past, but that seem to have been really like lost or subsumed in the more like academic social constructivist frameworks we're often operating in now. But so like one organizer that I really have always admired a bunch Fred Hampton from the Black Panthers, who who tended really strongly to be like, I, I don't care about your identity at all. I care about, you know, the actual material conditions people are subject to and what people have actually experienced. And so, I mean, in the United States in particular, anyway, we tend to speak in terms of sociological categories where there's like statistical probabilities of having experienced something. Like, obviously, people of color are more likely to be incarcerated than white people, things like that. But to me, the underlying, like the the actual core predictor would be like, has somebody been incarcerated in terms of like, if we could actually guess what their political outlook would be and how willing, like how much they would have derived from their experience, a willingness to engage in certain types of confrontation. And that gets into... That gets into a category of like a really important category of distinction between people that I think the political frameworks that I encounter these days really tend to overlook because it totally transcends demographics, which is just experience of trauma in like, say, childhood, for instance. And that has that has a profoundly predictive effect on, um, you know, I, I spent some time talking about how there's cross species homologies in terms of like the effects on brain structure and neurochemical signatures and things like that from developmental trauma. But, you know, like developmental trauma is in fact something that is experienced in like rich white suburbs. You know, it's, it's, it's patchy. And it, it like, it's like I said, it transcends, there's no one demographic predictor that can be made of it. But one of the important insights that cross species biology psychology, brain imaging studies, things like that have given us is that the experience of developmental trauma plays a huge role in mediating aggressive behaviors and how willing people are to engage in certain types of confrontation, to take certain kinds of risk, to endure certain types of adversity, right? And this has absolutely everything to do with political struggle with you know in in my experience of political struggle there always comes a point when the consequences really start coming in you know when when people are really realizing that prison is a is a reality or that you know like somebody might die or somebody has died and this is when the thinking solely along demographic lines really starts to break down because i i think that like, that is a point at which the real question is who is willing to embrace this level of adversity? Who is willing to engage in this kind of confrontation that might have some real consequences for us? Sorry, so I was going to say, like, when you say trauma from the imaging evidence, et cetera, et cetera, like, are you saying that people who have experienced trauma, particularly, say, childhood trauma, are more likely to be up for, say, more difficult tasks to be done, or they shy away from it? I think there's a fair amount of evidence that they're more able to to engage in certain really difficult tasks, and especially more able to engage in aggressive behavior. So would they not skew then towards conservative? Well, I, so I think that's this fascinating part of the landscape where 
What, what I find to be true, and at some point I would like to make this case more rigorously, but uh, what I find to be true is that there's two, there's two components of aggressiveness, and one is like an innate variation and then another is the experience that you've had. And so I think that what we find in politics is that people with more right-wing political outlooks tend to have a more innate predisposition towards aggression, and that makes them better at acquiring power, essentially. We can look at both history and just how things are playing out now. Like in the United States, Far right wingers have killed a bunch of people. Far left wingers have killed like maybe nobody to maybe like one or two people in the last few years. But then I think that if people don't have a ton of innate aggression, but they have a bunch of experiences with conflict and violence, and we can look at we can look at cross species similarities here and see how this is true, even in mice, like mice that are bred for low aggression will live in really peaceful ways with other mice unless they are put into a developmental context where they have to fight a bunch, at which point they become just as good at fighting as any other mouse. So it's like these two conditions have to be met for people, I think, to be both to, to both have some kind of egalitarian political framework, like you were saying, you know, like eco, social, anarcho, whatever, just like anything in that broad domain. They have to innately be less aggressive, but then in order for them to be good at actually engaging in contests for power with people who are more aggressive, they, they also have to cross this threshold of having had experiences of developmental trauma and violence that, that predispose them to, to taking conflicts to those places and accepting those risks, essentially. So we're going to beat the crap out of some young kids. <laughs> No, I'm I'm being facetious, but like, so how does one apply such a thing? You know, it seems like that it might be a valid theory of some statistical overview of what drives, say, left revolutionaries, say, for example, broadly radical leftists. But like, it doesn't seem like a systematizable insight ethically. Well, I mean, okay, so I think it's systematizable in, in two distinct regards. And, and one is it just in terms of, again, how we talk about who belongs or who has entitlement to make decisions or whose voice is valid in moments of political struggle. So this, again, like, this just refers to the the empirical reality of organizing certainly in the united states but I, but i think elsewhere where moments of political struggle often escalate like along a necessary trajectory until they reach this point where real consequences start to come in and then because the way that egalitarian politics are done so heavily reflects these academic frameworks that exclusively orient towards socialization along lines of like race, gender, sexual orientation with like mentions of class, but usually not actually really with that much meaningful class analysis. What, what always happens in those moments is that somebody who meets demographic criteria, like somebody who is in fact statistically more likely to have experienced horrible things, you know, uh, but who hasn't personally, who personally is actually fairly comfortable, who is practicing what I would call the politics of somebody with something to lose, right? Somebody who is relatively comfortable and has not had developmental experiences that make them prone towards these sorts of conflicts will inevitably be identified as like the voice of oppressed demographics, the voice of people who are really suffering. And then that person will say, like, it's it's time to de-escalate. We've taken this too far. And then not listening to them will be characterized by a whole panoply of different establishment figures from the police to a pipeline corporation to like a liberal politician as somehow being like, you know, disrespectful to oppressed groups or whatever. And so, you know, like this would be just in terms of like a framing, just in terms of like a set of principles that we apply to these moments of political rupture, uh, just in terms of like 
whose perspective is valid, who, who finds who to do what with, and like, you know, like what's a valid sort of like a decision-making body. I, I think like this is a way just to push back on some of those political machinations that have so incessantly just totally like, I don't know, negated political momentum. It's like, just to make it tangible real quick, I guess I would, I would cite my experience at Standing Rock, which um, was super interesting because on, on, on one level, like I really do want to acknowledge, I, you know, I'm, I'm very down for that framing that says that in order for the earth and humanity to survive, a resurgence of indigenous perspectives is necessary, right? Like I, I really, and, and I think being there, there was in almost just undeniable, like th just like literally the way it felt was almost, you know, like totally undeniable. And you'd have to be like, yeah, this, this is way more of an answer than what other people are doing. But at the same time, if you reduce it exclusively to identity, like, I, I think that it's one of those things that like about necessary, but not sufficient conditions. Like, if you reduce it exclusively to indigenous identity, then you end up listening to like supposedly like anybody who who meets indigenous like identity criteria has this like deep insight. Elizabeth Warren. I mean, for instance, Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> <laughs> Joking, but you know, but, uh, not really. But, uh... I mean, obviously not really, but but really, like what actually happened was that uh, tribal governments and people who essentially have liberal political perspectives, who have something to lose, who both have some material economic well-being and also have not had like the really harsh experiences that, yes, Native people are far, far more like statistically likely to have experienced. You know, but like somebody in a position of power says like we, we have to de-escalate. And that's exactly what happened. Those political debates were actually really noteworthy, not for how they were totally different from white political organizing, but how much they recapitulated the exact same discussions. Like, should we wear masks? Should we not wear masks? Respectability politics, you know, like all of these, like these, just like the exact same debates that consume other moments of political rupture happened there. And um, the kind of like liberal indigenous political establishment, the tribal governments and people like that were really able to exert control at, at key moments by using these these academic narratives about identity. And so like this is a way to push back on that and orient people towards, I guess, basically just what people have actually experienced. So when you say it's a way to push back, do you mean like it's a kind of a it's a way for people to understand what's going on or there's a specific strategy associated with it. No. Yeah. It's, it's not, I, I guess I wouldn't say that I feel like I'm articulating any particular strategy. Yeah. I'd say the former, it's a way to engage the rhetoric that I think feels more meaningful. It's so, it's just proven to be so powerful, like such a powerful tool to negate political activity, to claim that it like it disrespects an identity or that it's like, you know, somehow contributing to oppression. And I think that this is a way to offer a really concrete framework for saying like this, that is actually like an insufficient, like there, there's some good points in there, but it's a totally insufficient set of criteria for deciding whose voice matters and who should, you know, like how we should make decisions in these moments. And then I also think, like I would say that I, I feel like one of the key ways that these academic frameworks get so much credibility is because I think people just think they sound sophisticated. Like I don't think Foucault or whoever has that many good points, but I think they do a good job of being like, look at our seventh level, like, you know, theory gibberish. Like if you think what we think, you must be really sophisticated. And so I think it's also a way to look at a bunch of like really complex science and stuff and kind of like push back on that, like like show how kind of ultimately simplistic and reductionist a lot of those notions are and how if you if you want to be really sophisticated, <laughs> you need some cognitive science and some biology. And the value form. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, so <laughs> you need the value form. We need the value form. <laughs> you need to understand the distinction between value and the value form. God That's damn. true. Yeah. OK, so that, that's we've struck on trauma and identity. What else do you think comes out of this for, say, our politics? I think another great point to hit on is this idea. I think that 
the framework that I'm offering, it's, it's really interesting to see how not wanting to talk about human nature or the role of biology in human behavior has all of these unintended consequences, all these things that you wouldn't really anticipate at the outset. But one of the really big ones that comes up in 20th century social sciences that I think is very much still playing out today is this tendency to not look at individual to all you know to always emphasize the structural analysis and social construction at the expense of looking at individuals and individual psychological variation and and that's like i mean it's really i can't remember the exact quote but durkheim towering giant of sociology you know said something like very explicitly like this to understand social facts you must exclusively look at social structures and never at the psychology of individuals. John Tooby and Lita Cosmides, who I quote often in my podcast, quip about this, where they're like, when you really think about this, what Durkheim is actually saying is that to understand people, you should look anywhere other than people, right? I think that one of the really interesting ways that this plays out is in terms of, in terms of power and this idea that when we look at different societies that have existed, different configurations of political power, the way that people have been sort of like taught to analyze these situations is in tr exclusively pretty much in terms of like ideologies, right? So this is like, this gets into that weird, like to, to make it concrete, it, it's like the endless, endless discussions that have happened about the extent to which Stalin's Soviet Union and Hitler's Germany were similar places or societies or whatever. And then it's like all that horseshoe theory bullshit, all these ideas that like the left and the right are kind of ultimately the same thing or whatever. And I think that there, there can just be like a ton of like, you, you can engage in like a whole lifetime's worth of really confusing and not very productive discussion. If you're exclusively looking at ideology as like the predictor of how these societies actually like were constituted and and the dynamics that played out in them but then um if you look at individual psychological variation and ask the question like is there some sense in which there are important psychological predictors of power of who comes to power or who who does what to gain what kind of power that that maybe i don't know that maybe stalin and uh hitler had in common Th then you can like you can kind of start to see some really like at the very least i think it would be like really safe to say that both of those people lacked some some empathy in a pretty conspicuous regard right and that is a, that's a psychological metric that that has a uh, strong correspondences and brain activity and stuff like that that is actually highly predictive like a lack of empathy is in other aspects of the psychopathy scales and a whole bunch of related psychological metrics are actually highly predictive of like being in positions of power both in the actual political power structure and in like corporate power structures right yeah it's interesting like that durkheim quote i haven't read any durkheim but it's like if you if they talk about social structures outside of the, the humans it basically says that the social structures are other they're not of the human you know where do they come from? Do they fall out of the sky? Did aliens impose them on us? Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. So, so getting into this like, this idea of corporate psychopath theory or whatever, I think there is a huge class element in in how they actually define what a psychopath is. You know, they if you do a psychopath test, they'll say, you know, like, do you do things on the spur of the moment kind of and not without thinking but like that might just skew for the type of people who end up in prison who got called psychopaths while actually other psychopaths don't have that problem but they're able to you know maneuver themselves into positions so it's kind of you know of power in using different types of low empathy political plays but in, in the the people who have it who who end up in crime might just have a tendency towards like not being very good at long-term planning and having had that trait so th that's one thing but also then again it's like to get to kind of Durkheim's point as in like the structure is highly important with respect to the ability for these types of people to proliferate upwards 
I, I, no, totally. I mean, I remember, I, I, I emphatically agree. I've read all these different psychopathy scales and stuff. And, and there's part of it where I'm like, yeah, that's deeply insightful. And I bet that reflects some really like important innate variation. And then there's other stuff where I'm like, oh, you're just, you're just telling me I'm a psychopath because of like, <laughs> like the neighborhood I'm from or whatever, you know, where it's like, I remember, I remember walking around with a friend once and she was like, have you ever heard the class-based theory of like, a sense of time. And I remember preparing myself, like I laughed and I remember I, like I was kind of preparing myself for something I thought was going to be like totally ridiculous. Right. You know, but, but she was like, yeah, no, it's like poor people are thinking about today. Middle-class people are thinking about tomorrow and rich people are already so set up that they're kind of inhabiting a legacy and thinking about like, like the past and like how their family got where they are. And I was like, Oh huh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. But you know, like a lot of the, one of the measures of psychopathy that comes up over and over again, there's, there's a bunch of different scales, but there's a ton of overlap is this, this notion of impulsivity. And to me, that's like, I'm like, yeah, I like, I I've been beneath, beneath the official poverty line my whole life. And to me, like, that's just like imp what they call impulsivity. I call it being adaptable. Like it would be really stupid. Like being as poor as I've been a lot of my life, you absolutely can't plan. Like I couldn't plan for all the neighborhoods I've lived in that became too expensive for me to live in. So I had to move, you know, like, like when, when you're at a certain level of like chronic desperation, like, you know, there, there's a real need to not get too rigidly set in any particular like trajectory or whatever, you know, and that, so you end up ranking higher. Yeah, totally on the psychopathy scale, which is frustrating. And also you're more likely just to get goddamn caught. Well, I mean, I mean, just exactly right. Like the, the criminal psychopaths who caused the 2008 financial scandal, like crisis that not a single one of them ever faced consequences. But, you know, like I've been arrested for shoplifting, right. You know, for, for stealing like a couple dollars worth of food as opposed to. So, yeah, I mean, all, all that stuff, totally, totally, totally. But also like, I mean, I, I still do actually think, I think there's something really interesting there. Like one, a, a fascinating sort of like case study to apply to it is Donald Trump, right? Because I think that again, when, when we look at either like what he has been politically or what he's going to do, if you talk exclusively about like ideology or the, the nature of institutions, it's like, where, where do you really get, you know, like, like there's not, it's it's not like super predictive. Like I I'm a hundred percent confident that on election day in a few days, Donald Trump will declare victory no matter what, no matter what the electoral outcome is. And this is one of those things where it's like you could discuss this in terms of like right wing ideology or whatever for days, and you'd never really know. But I think it's a reflection of his psychology of the fact that he is like really incapable of thinking in terms other than self-aggrandizement and other than just sort of like claiming accomplishment and victory all the time. And that's just like this very incredibly like crudely simplistic childlike basic psychological template that he applies to literally every situation. And it's very impulsive. Like he often changes course really rapidly. He's not like a calculating person at all. I think he does actually exhibit precisely some of those elements of like a constellation of traits that you could get out of a bunch of different psychometrics, but like narcissism, you know, impulsive self-aggrandizement and lack of empathy, but also like this also relates to the class analysis you're talking about. I think like some of that lack of empathy, some of that inability to model what other people are experiencing or to be concerned with the consequences of your behavior on other people also is a, d a developmental consequence of, of being a rich kid. Like having power over people has this adverse consequence that you don't have to think about what they're experiencing. My own take on things is that it's both, you know, material class and biological material combination. Like if we think about like, say for example, like if it just, just struck me like thinking that like Durkheim quote, like you have to look at social structures to understand stuff. But like Engels, for example, came from a rich bourgeois family and actually ran a factory in fucking Manchester. Marx came from like a, you know, a middle-class lawyer's background. And to this idea that the trajectory of somebody is purely determined by their, you know, social class, you know, is a nonsense. I think like if you were to look at the majority of 
r- famous radical left thinkers, they skew actually towards being richer, you know, across all traditions. Which is something I've noticed that right wing thinkers love to point out. They they love to make that point as if it totally invalidates. But yeah, I mean, I, I there's totally right. There's like there's a there's innate factors, and that's I think that's really often what I'm getting at in the podcast is like often I'm looking at stuff that people orient to as like an exclusive explanatory framework, and I'm like, well, you're not wrong. But there's just a need for synthesis. There's other domains of, of information here and knowledge that that this really like is incoherent if you don't like integrate it into. And yeah, but like totally like there's there's like definitely like an innate an innate capacity for empathy question, a developmental experience question, which comes which totally comes down to class. And and I'm personally not surprised every time I see one of those right wingers be like, you know, a lot of the socialist thinkers were were actually like middle class kids or whatever. I mean, what I actually think about is how long it took me to understand. I, I I started having like really, you know, like spending a lot of time in political analysis when I was really young, but but no joke, it took me into my thirties to to understand the role that class had played in my life. And and I'm I'm really not exaggerating to understand that I had grown up poor and been poor my whole life. Like I literally, I think a lot of people who are experiencing poverty, it, like they just, they can't think in those terms as much because it's too primary of a reality in some sense. It's like actually easier to look at it from a little more on the outside. I totally agree. Like I, I went to, a, like I got a scholarship to go to a, a Catholic boarding school when I was 12 or whatever. And it's amazing how they train you. They train you to be like middle class bourgeois. The minute you go in the door, they had this system called seniority, right? So if a first year was playing in the handball alley and a second year came along, if you were playing a doubles game that was four years and he came on his own and he wanted to sit in the court and pick his ass, he would be able to kick you off. Like, and the first time that happened to us, we all started crying. We were like 12. This is so unfair. It's so unfair. And by the, the time second year comes around and your second year and they're in first year, you go around and you just piss off all the first years because, hey, you know, now I can do it, lads. Now I can do it. And it's like it, that stuff gets in on you. It gets in on you. And that's only like a minor thing. Like, me not coming from a wealthy background at all, just got a scholarship. But like that, that idea that you are superior, even though it would go against my inner, you know, nature, still some of it gets into your meta systems, which push maybe your, your kind of at, at a conceptual level, it kind of pushes against your innate structure. You know, that stuff is strong. No, to, I mean, totally. It's, it's this fascinating interplay. And I think, one of the experiences that I had that helped me refine just sort of like my my everyday experiential sense of this stuff was dating somebody who like I knew from kind of, you know, like direct the direct action scene or whatever, but who had really grown up on the other end of both the socioeconomic spectrum and the trauma spectrum. And, it, you know, like and it was great, like like we we could see all the ways in which we had all these innate similarities and it allowed us to like form this really productive political and personal union and like, you know, but then we could also just spend all this time in a pretty like uninhibited way without a lot of anxieties about offending anybody or whatever, assessing the respective blind spots, like the respective strengths and weaknesses that we had gained from our, from our experiences. And and like, and yeah, exactly like piecing out the the sort of like the innate contributors to our perceptual landscapes and then the like the just sort of like experiential developmental class bound trauma bound it's it's complex what makes people what they are is hyper 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 complex it defies any simple characterization and you know like and maybe that's the point in terms of me pushing back on some of these these like uh, conceptual analytical structures that are so often invoked in political movements is they, I just feel like they reduce to too few analytical variables. Yeah, I think that's true. And I, I think when it comes down to the biology, neuroscience, stuff like that, you know, the left is, it's, 
allergic to anything to do with that for, you know, pretty good reasons. You know, like Marx at least said some things that weren't negative. I don't know how positive he was about eugenics, which is kind of staggering to me, as in like talking about not dialectical or not as kind of systemic thinking. So it shows that this stuff can get into it shows we're not Im- Im- immune to all of this stuff. But like, so I think that, you know, all that eugenic stuff, because biology in politics has, I would say, nearly uniformly been associated, apart from Lysenko or somebody in uh, Russia. But it's kind of like nearly uniformly in popular, you know, in popular political talk being associated with, I would think, you know, the far right, but also establishment politics, if we're being honest. Yeah, I mean, I what what I really think, I, I so I'm I'm super fond of this this anecdote, which I think I think kind of encapsulates some of my frustration with left thinking around innate contributors to behavior and perception, which is that apparently apparently Stalin hated not eugenics but genetics, just like the entire science of genetics, because he thought it was distinctly an American science. And he thought that it, you know, like he thought it would promote some kind of like survival of the fittest, like hyper-capitalist framework. So there is, there's this geneticist whose work I've relied a lot on in the podcast, uh, did all these experiments with domesticating foxes that are really interesting, but his brother, I can't, I can't remember his name, but something Belyev was also this really prominent geneticist in Russia and, you know, and Stalin had him shot. And, and I think that's like, that's like, <laughs> that's a good thing to quip about is like, yeah, he didn't like that he was promoting the science that supposedly inevitably promoted like a hyper competitive, like, uh, you know, capitalistic framework. So he killed the guy, you know, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that'll learn him, that'll learn him. <laughs> that'll teach you. <laughs> but, but, but it is like, I mean, totally like it's, it's a very valid point that biology and politics is associated with hierarchical outlooks for a reason. There, there is a really long, exceptionally dark history there. The, the so-called science of eugenics that, that came into vogue in the late 19th century was very directly cited by the Nazis. You know, like it, it, it did actually translate into like real world atrocity. But I, I think that what I would say about like the, the general characterization that I'd make of it is that there there's like a there's a continuum of political outlooks among people who apply biology to human behavior, much like there is anywhere else. You know, it's it's sort of like people in the West who are opposing Islamophobia are perfectly capable of saying that, you know, like there's a huge range of perspectives associated with Islam. And like somewhere on that range, there's people who want to exterminate people who disagree with them. There's like a more right-wing perspective, like, but also obviously there's all these people who want to find ways for us to live together. And, And this is exactly true. Like when you look at, when you look at the actual people who, yes, there's, there's total darkness, you know, like, like dictators and stuff like that have invoked biological reasoning to commit their atrocities. But the, like, I think the real question is, did they commit the atrocities because they read some biology and because those ideas inevitably tend towards that? Or were, was that kind of where they were at anyway? And they invoked that as a form of reasoning, you know, like as a form of justification, because certainly you can also look at people who didn't invoke biology in their explanations of human behavior, who committed very similar atrocities. And then you can also find, and this is, I mean, especially in like actual modern science in terms of like who's writing about this and researching this now, you can just find so many people who they're, they're not as radical as me. They're not people who spent their life like blockading trains or whatever, but you can find all of these scientists who are like, yeah, I study chimpanzee and bonobo aggression because I want to understand how to create a society based on cooperation. You know, like, so there's, uh, there's the same range of perspectives in the biological sciences as there is anywhere else, basically. Oh yeah. Not within the sciences. I, I assume like most scientists, they actually s- vastly skew towards people who are more open and, and left and politically less aggressive one thing like that uh, i'll throw my neuroscience in here okay this is something i don't know you probably are really aware of this stuff 
But uh, I was talking to a guy once and he was telling me that he was like a professor of psychiatry, I think. And he was telling me that that if you want to break a habit, you have to to form a new strong neuronal connection. You need to do that thing for 60 days straight. And that like how the brain structure works is that like our brain likes to be lazy is the way he described it as in like. When we want to, we have a, something in front of us, we have our room. Do, should I tidy my room or not, say, right? That our our brain structure has neural paths that are involved in this, making this decision. And that our brain will tend to, because it's, it's, I think you said, very heavy on glucose, I think. And that it basically looks for the options just internally that are, you know, most efficient for the brain. And like that, it does this by making repeated paths and solutions to certain problems. So if I like literally don't, I'm, I'm Jordan Peterson, right? I don't tidy my bedroom every day of the week, you know. And then like once a month, I have this great weight on me as I'm drowning in my own filth in my bedroom. And then I have to make this decision. So it seems to me like that this idea that about how people end up becoming, say, conservative or radical or left or centrist or whatever a lot of it has to do with like these learned neuronal you know pathways or whatever do you think that there is something we can learn from that kind of neurological analysis i mean yeah i think that's that's exactly right you know like there's the brain is a profoundly metabolically expensive organ there's like decent evidence that Ultimately, humans were able to evolve such big brains because we started using fire to like digest more calories and that, you know, like we just couldn't have done it otherwise. And so like, yeah, it, it's generally true that uh, brain activity is path dependent. Once you form a, a certain set of connections, a certain set of circuits, it's it's metabolically easier it's metabolically less expensive and subjectively easier to just stay in those patterns than to try, you know, it's like, we've all had the, we're both math geeks, right? So like, we've both had the experience where it's like confronting the uncertainty, like trying to learn something is just like, it's subjectively kind of hard, you know, like there's something sort of difficult and uncomfortable about it, even if you're the type of person who also finds it fascinating and beautiful and rewarding. And yeah, this does have everything to do with variation in political outlook. I think that another another way to look at it is through the the activity of the anterior cingulate cortex, which is a brain region that has multiple functions, but one of them is to to monitor conflict between habitual behavior and what's actually happening in the world and say like, mm, no, no, like, you know, it's maybe time to look at some new options or whatever, right? And, and that brain region is like the bigger that brain, you can just scan people's brains and guess how they'll vote in presidential elections in the United States based on the size of their ACCs compared to the rest of their brains. Like the more left you are, the bigger you have a brain region you statistically will tend to have that, that looks for like conflicts with habitual behavior and external conditions and promotes novel behavior. And so in terms of political implications, I think two that I would cite, one which I think we did kind of get into last episode is that youth is hugely associated with greater perceptual and behavioral plasticity. So that's one, I think that's one demographic sort of like distinction that is under acknowledged in our discourse about like identity and the relationship between different demographic criteria and political outlook like young people are are way more likely to perceive the problems that exist in the society they inhabit than people who have inhabited it for a long time and who've like really built those pathways to being you know like accustomed to it and so that that has significant consequences just in, i mean not that nobody organizes as youth or whatever that does exist but i think I still think it's often overlooked how how profoundly significant age is as a predictor and, and how much young people of many different backgrounds tend to be more similar to one another than they are to older people of their chosen sociological category that like the media would analyze, you know. 
On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. Thank you.